Hey guys, Kim here, and you are tuned in to Kim E, the Diabetes MP. Today, we are back for another video. We are going to talk about pre-diabetes. And I'm actually going to make a series over pre-diabetes, highlighting different aspects of it. Today, we're going to get into just an overview of it. But I feel like discussing pre-diabetes is necessary when it comes to diabetes education and management, okay? We now know through just research that a large amount of people in our country have prediabetes. Some people know about it. Some people don't know about it. Okay. And so one of the favorite quotes of mine, if you've been around here long enough, you know that I've said this before, but an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we tackle in on these people that are in this group, we can prevent a lot of people from even having diabetes. So I wanted to discuss this and do a series of videos over prediabetes because it is very important that we focus in. This is a golden opportunity to focus in on, on people that fall into this category. So without further, further ado, let's get into it. Now, before we get into prediabetes, I do want to let you all know about something that I just created and put together, and it's the MP Diabetes Starter Pack. Now, I offer a myriad of different cheat sheets and guides and just freebies for nurse practitioners when it comes to diabetes education and management. But depending upon when you found me on the internet, you may not know about all of them. And I feel like, you know, you may have one of my freebies, but you don't know about the other freebies. And I want to just have a place where they're all housed together. Now, I have different workbooks and different. I even have a mini course, an insulin mini course, a cheat sheets over the diabetic medications. And I want everyone that finds me to have access to all of that. So if you're already on my email list, you don't have to do anything. It's been emailed to you for access um, to access that. But if you're new here, go ahead and click that link in the description box if this is something that you would be interested in. Just wanted to let you all know that. And also, if you are new, please consider subscribing to this channel and dinging that notification bell so you do not miss an upload. Okay, so let's get into pre-diabetes. Now, like I said in the intro, a large amount of people fall into this category. Actually, about a third of American adults. Okay. That's a lot of people. Okay. A third of American adults fall into this very category. Now, simply put, prediabetes is having a high blood sugar, but your A1C doesn't quite meet the threshold of diabetes. Now, the hemoglobin A1C we know is the diagnostic test, the blood test that is used to diagnose one with diabetes. And Per the guidelines, diabetes is 7% or higher, but here's where prediabetes gives us a little bit of gray area and a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to our interventions. Now, to be classified as a prediabetic or someone with prediabetes, you would need to have an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4, okay? Now, if a person has a reading of 6.5 up to about that 6.9, you know, range. And if they have that reading on two occasions, okay, consecutively, you can consider them a diabetic at that point. So let me repeat that. Prediabetes is considered 5.7 to 6.4% with the hemoglobin A1C, but if a person has a reading of 6.5 all the way up to that 6.977%, 7 you can consider them a diabetic if they have had that reading on two occasions, two separate occasions. Now, what are signs and symptoms of prediabetes? Now, honestly, there's no clear signs or symptoms. A lot of people don't even know that they are diabetic. This is why it's very important for us to screen people who have risk factors, okay? And because many people won't even know. Without that A1C, you really wouldn't even know if a patient is even um, in, this, in this category or not. 
Now, here are some typical risk factors that you would consider, you know, um, screening a patient for if they fall under this. I'm going to read it off so I don't leave anything off. But if a patient is overweight or obese, if they are 45 years old or older, if they have a sedentary lifestyle, which basically is if they're not active at least three times throughout the week doing some type of physical activity. So if they're not active up to three times a week, then you can consider consider them sedentary. Um, if they have a first degree relative that is already diagnosed with diabetes. So if they have a mother, if they have a, um, a sibling or a child that is all that has diabetes, you know, typically you'll hear someone that says that their parent has diabetes or something like that. That's when you would consider um, screening them for diabetes. If you have a woman who had gestational diabetes, we know that that's kind of a lot of women that have de, uh, gestational diabetes eventually develop diabetes. And then also if a patient has PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome, that would make them insulin resistant. Now, there are racial groups that are at more risk for developing diabetes. So this is a golden opportunity in pre-diabetes to really help them um, navigate this so we can prevent it altogether. Of course, you're going to have the African-American population as well as the Hispanic Latino population, as well as the uh, Native American 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 Indian populations and the specific and the Pacific American Islanders. Um, these are all groups that are at risk for developing um, diabetes. So when it comes to prediabetes, we really want to take time to really focus in on these racial groups. Okay, so here is a tidbit that most people don't know when it comes to prediabetes. Now, most people before being diagnosed with diabetes, they have been having signs internally. Their body has been compensating for about seven to 12 years, depending upon, upon the person and depending on what research you read, anywhere between seven to 12 years, people have been kind of hanging out in that pre-diabetes category. Now, around nine years of that, around that nine year mark, the pancreas starts to get tired. OK, that pancreas has been working, cranking out more insulin to compensate because typically you don't see the elevation in the fasting blood, blood glucose. Sorry about that. But you'll see the elevation more so in your postprandial glucose. That's after eating. So to compensate for that, that pancreas is cranking out more insulin, trying to compensate and correct. OK, so around that nine year mark. The pancreas starts to poop out. It starts to fail. It gets tired. And that is when you will start to see the fasting blood glucose start to elevate. And that's about the time where the patient is coming into our office. We're getting, you know, fasting blood labs, you know, and we find out, oh, you got some problems here. That's when, you know, we start to intervene. But it's been going on years prior. So this is why if you have a patient that has risk factors and multiple risk factors, and we know that use your clinical judgment, you want to start screening people earlier. OK, and just not getting that serum glucose, because with prediabetes, sometimes it won't come up with the fasting blood glucose with that serum glucose. It won't come up. We need to get the A1C. We need to see over time. What has that blood glucose been? What is that glycine? control bin. So if you have a patient that has those risk factors, really consider getting more than just the regular CMP that will tell us the glucose, get that A1C so we can intervene even earlier. Because again, there's years there's years of this patient and their their pancreas trying to compensate and correct. Our goal is to save that pancreas. We want to protect that pancreas. And if we're already dealing with the patient, because this is typically what happens to a lot of patients because they go so many years with that pancreas trying to compensate and correct. By the time we start to intervene, the pancreas is already tired. 
Okay. And then you throw in a medication like a sulfonuria that overworks that pancreas again. We're losing good pancreas cells. Hence why it's so important to really double down. Okay. In this time of prediabetes, because we can save our patients the heartache. We can save our patients having to go through diabetes and we can actually start to kind of reverse some of that insulin resistance that's going on. Now, quickly, very simply, what are your options with prediabetes? How do we prevent it? How do we treat it? How do we reverse it? Because it is reversible, guys. And simply put, lifestyle modifications, okay? Now, there is nothing more effective than lifestyle modifications. It is literally the most effective thing more than metformin is lifestyle modifications. And if you can get your patient to do this and to be aggressive with it, therein is your reversal, okay? Now I made a whole video over lifestyle modifications. I've made different types of videos and I'll link them all below. So you can go back and look over that. I just recently did some videos over um, the food guidelines for diabetes coming down from ACE, you know, and so I'll link those in the description box so you can go and view them after this video as well. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you. Now, in this video, I mentioned a lot of different things like insulin resistance. I talked a little bit about treatment and intervention. I plan on covering all of those in future videos. So if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe, ding that notification bell so you don't miss those videos when they come out. I also want to remind you of the NP Diabetes Starter Pack. If you don't already have it, if you're not already on my email list, go ahead and click the link in the description box so you can get that pack, e that pack emailed over to you. Again, you have been sitting here with me, Kim E, the Diabetes NP. I do want to tell you one more thing before I log off here. Let us never, ever leave a nurse behind. Alrighty.